Good evening, dear ladies and gentlemen. I am Mangal Silva, Chairman Civil Engineering Sectional Committee. I would like to warmly welcome all of you for today's public lecture. Let me give a brief introduction about today's our resource person. Engineer Shiromal Fernando, leading structural engineer Sri Lanka, best known for his engineering work on many high-rise buildings in country, including the 350-meter Colombo Lotus Tower, the One Trish Project, Cinnamon Life Waterfront, Integrated Resort, Prime Land, Twin Peaks, Avic, and many more projects throughout Sri Lanka and various projects in countries such as United Kingdom, Maldives, Myanmar, and Saudi Arabia. He holds the degrees BSc Engineering, Honours in Civil Engineering, and MPhil degree from the University of Borato, Sri Lanka. And he is also a Chartered Engineer of the Institution of Engineers, Sri Lanka. As the founder and deputy chairman, engineer Shiromal Farandu currently leads civil and structural engineering consultants private limited. Shiromal Farandu is the current chairman of CTBUH, that is Council for Tall Building and Urban Habitat, Sri Lanka, and the vice president of Green Building Council of Sri Lanka since year 2010. Mr. Fernando is also a visiting lecturer at University of Maratua. University of Peradeniya, University of Sri Jawaradanapura and Kruhuna Engineering Faculties and City School of Architecture and also serves as a senior lecturer at Kotalawa Defense University. In addition, he, he has also served as a resource person for education sessions organized by IESL, Society of Structural Engineers Sri Lanka, Green Building Council and most of the government and non-government universities for both structural and architectural undergraduates. Mr. Fernando has enrolled in over 50 conference papers and four chaired number of research conferences, CTBUH forums. He has been the co-author for the Tall Building Design Guide and Construction Guideline. Mr. Fernando was a team leader in the technical committee for version 1, 2, 2.1 of Green Rating System, while also serving as a member of the editorial committee for the Structural Earthquake Detailing Manual and Tsunami 2004 Sri Lanka Experience published by Society of Structural Engineers, Sri Lanka. With that brief introduction, let me invite Engineer Shiroma Alternadu to do the public lecture today. Thank you. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Engineer Mangala uh, Silva, the ch chairman of the Civil Engineering Sectional Committee for uh, for the kind introduction, and also chasing me, uh, me to deliver this uh, uh, talk to uh, the ISL. And also, I'd like to mention Professor Disanayaka, the chairman of. Uh, President of the ISL and the Vice President Kamala Agnuardana, and all the uh, committee members uh, for being here. It's an honor to uh, deliver a talk at ISL. Uh, so, uh, so that today, uh, what I'm trying to uh, uh, discuss is uh, the lessons that I learned uh, uh, during my designs and constructions of uh, mega structures. Uh, so I was fortunate to be uh, involved in these structures during the last uh, 10 years. Uh, so Lotus Tower, Twin Peaks, Cinnamon Life, Derwan, Marina Square, uh, CCC, Hyatt Regency. So, so these, uh, these uh, projects gave me a lot of insight uh, uh, during construction and design. So basically, my talk will be on these subjects, uh, since aspects. Uh, we, I will talk about the conceptual design, site investigation, substructure, what are the uh, issues that I face, and how I solve that issue, and superstructure, and some of the miscellaneous challenges uh, with respect to the structures that I design. 
So basically, uh, with respect to design, design has uh, three different aspects. One is the conceptual design, uh, detail design, and uh, preliminary design. So basically, uh, with respect to the uh, the the importance of that uh, design um, aspects, conceptual design is the most important thing with respect to uh, the design stages. So because conceptual design decides the 80% of the cost. So basically, very important that we, uh, we conceptualize uh, the structure at the initial stage and it will only take about 10% of the total design time. So basically, most of the uh, top designers, uh, architects, engineers, uh, and the quantity surveyors, uh, green consultants, and also the, the uh, developers side consultants has to be there to decide this concept. If you get the wrong concept, uh, your building will not get built. So most of the time, 80% of the people, uh, are, there are uh, most of the designs are not get built. So I'm lucky that most of my structures are being built because the concept was correct at the first stage. So with respect to the site investigation, it's very important. Uh, we do a proper investigation. Now when we look, look at Lotus Tower, we advanced 30, 36 boreholes, about uh, 40 meters into the rock. So most of the time, what we try to cut corners is uh, the uh, is uh, uh, during the site investigation, and uh, do only a couple of boreholes. So if you don't do proper boreholes, you will get into real trouble. So this um, and uh, generally, a lot of people come to us uh, with a lot of projects. Uh, let's say they don't. Uh, we don't know whether they have the money to build the project. So uh, most of the time what I do is I give a very good uh, uh, investigation uh, specification, which will cost about 10, 10 million rupees or more. So if they have, yeah, they are really interested in uh, building the project, building the building, they should at least, I mean, we are trying to spend billions of rupees. And then if they cannot afford 10 million rupees, then that means something wrong with their uh, thinking. So, uh, so basically, the investigation revealed that uh, rock is only twelve meters now. So then only we can see what is the kind of foundation. Otherwise, if you don't properly do the site investigation, uh, you will get into uh, the wrong conclusions. So here, what we uh, did was a rough foundation for the tower on rock. Now this project. Uh, Initially, you can see the larger dots, uh, only a, a three acre site, only uh, eight boreholes or nine boreholes have been advanced. And the, 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 it was a, uh, the geotechnical consultant or foreign consultant, he was uh, the number one in the world, number one. So only nine boreholes. So this this is we are talking about eighty story one building. Uh, one building is taller than Rolls Town. So when we came into the uh, and also they they wanted to optimize the foundation and they conduct a, a test called uh, Osterberg cell. It cost at that time around six. Million to the uh, the to the client. So uh, we we got involved, and then we this uh, this uh, we when you look at the site, and we had three basements. The rock level is only uh, eleven twelve meters. So basically, you cannot do piles. When you when you do the six uh, three basements, you almost hit the rock. 
so this is uh, so but they have even decide on the piles they have done the most expensive test on the piles but you cannot do piles finally when we plot the, the, the rock and it is uh, very shallow and what we did was we did pad foundation on rock in this one i will discuss about the foundations later and this project again foreign consultants at the time advanced only 3 13 boreholes when we got got involved 13 acre site so all designs done including tender we got involved and i said i said 13 bowl is not enough he said, the foreign consultant said no it's okay we can design the building according to that uh, those were i said one bowl per acre they know they realize they had a big mistake because you are looking at a very small picture and try to decide on the foundation after that they said okay we were first appointed as the uh, the local consultants to supervise then they said okay then uh, of course you might need more boreholes or supervise there are about more than 1200 piles uh so we don't know where to terminate the piles so when we um then they asked us to uh us to uh, do the uh, boreholes locate the boreholes so generally uh, i uh, when uh, when i uh, the standard is you need to have at least 25 meters one borehole so when we look do that we advance 46 boreholes so and the rock was completely different from region to region some areas you cannot even pile there, there are on rock so it is very important uh, this is the le lesson that i learned from that project so very important you need to uh, so basically when we do a project we 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 uh, adequately do the site investigation now this is a project a typical project called twin peaks where under the uh, under the towers two towers i have advanced uh, five, uh, 10 boreholes and it is going about 15 meters into the rock and other areas where the podium is we only advance only 5 meters so i generally give a very specific uh, specification for the site investigation paper because i don't not just uh, because we have we will we have to go for tender how many boreholes what is the test that we need what is the investigation that we need number of uh, uh, samples that we need to take everything i specify then only we can compare one apple to apple with different uh, contractor so basically you get good quality rock where you can have about 6 mpa in for in bearing and also you can get very weak rock so here this is a trizen project uh, where Uh, the the socketing depth was around 10 d but it can do uh, so basically if you understand the proper uh, uh, proper uh, geotechnical because when we say 10 d uh, uh, most of the clients engineers said how can you do 10 d in the rock but rock is very weak so they are therefore actually for that project uh, it was a competition between uh, uh, we work for the contractor between uh, uh, the contractors and what we uh, because uh, most of the there were a lot of foreign uh, consultants supporting their contractors and our foundation design was 500 million less than the uh then the uh the foreign consultant so that is how uh, uh, 
And here, this is uh, when we do the celestial residencies. Uh, you can see the you get the soil, and then you get a, a sandstone. So if we do not do enough boreholes, we might not get uh, get uh, we will not get uh, uh, you, we will miss this. Then if when the the contractor comes to the uh, scene, they will claim. So if you want to do uh, uh, make sure uh, uh, to avoid any claims, uh, we need to do proper investigation. So let's go to the substructure. So basically, when you look at the substructure, you can, uh, this is how most of the uh, structures that I have done is from bottom up. We dig and, or uh, there are some uh, uh, people uh, do from top down, where you can, uh, most of my experience is bottom up systems. So the main issue will be uh, to protect the neighboring buildings when we go down. So when you go down, definitely you go down below their foundation. And also, you will also uh, reduce the um, water table in the adjacent uh, sites. So generally, in the analysis, it's uh, pretty straightforward where you have the active pressure from the soil and the water and also the surcharge pressure and then the passive uh, again from the soil and the water. So basically, now we have tools to analyze the sequence, the soil structure interaction, like plexus, um, soil works, etc. So if you do not properly, uh, if you do not be careful, you can end up in a disaster like this. So, if there are no, uh, this is uh, one of our sites, uh, actually Colombo CCC, where the sites are the uh, sites, uh, the surrounding, there are no major sites. So, we can take a risk with uh, steel, uh, HIRNs, and timber plants. And here, uh, at waterfront, next to the Bay Lake, we need to have a, a very watertight structure. And um, the contractor proposed to use uh, timber, sorry, steel sheet piles. The problem with sheet piles is it's, uh, the stiffness is very low. So you have a lot of uh, stress to, uh, to support that uh, force. One time, one day, this one sheet pile gave away. And within one hour, the whole uh, basement was filled with water. Luckily, nobody got injured, but most of the machines were under uh, uh, in the district. So it's very important. There's a risk of, of, uh, of uh, doing sheet piles very close to the barrel lake or water body. So this is another project uh, that we do. Uh, uh, this is uh, boat piles. So basically, both pile retaining walls are much cheaper than the second pile or diaphragm walls. Here, uh, what? Uh, uh, so in, a, in this kind of thing, you have a gap, and the gap should be filled with a grout pile behind the wall. This is the second pile wall uh, that uh, we have done uh, in the Avi Castoria proje project, uh, where you can even have. Uh, uh, it's very stiff. If the surcharge load is uh, very low, then you can even have cantilever, uh, cantilever piles without uh, water ingress through the the second pile. This is a uh, this is one of my first projects at uh, for for doing with uh, second piles uh, near uh, uh, at uh, 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 Selinko Celestial Residence is now the hard project. Uh, there was a seven seven story building next to it and the, so we we basically designed a cantilever uh, cantilever uh, second pile wall here this uh, project uh, is uh, called continental project near bamblapitiya 40 story project, uh, building and there were about uh, two and a half basements 
and here the there was a, a building called pearl grand next to this building so i used uh, uh, diaphragm wall contact surface diaphragm wall all over the uh, all of uh, uh, all the perimeters uh, the main problem with diaphragm walls are because uh, in Sri Lanka, we don't have the, we cannot socket them. So you need to have enough embedment depth to, uh, to counterbalance the forces. So there are incidences, uh, um, there has been subdivision behind the cutoff wall if we, because, uh, uh, because it is not properly, uh, we don't have gone to the proper depth. So what I did here is near to the building, I, I asked them to do a uh, uh, contiguous uh, boat pile wall because uh, what I thought was this is very close by. When you uh, when you uh, uh, have a larger trench, there's a possibility of uh, failure of this, uh, this side. So uh, what I did was uh, near to the building, I used the boat piles. I allowed them to uh, do the uh, do the uh, diaphragm wall in the other areas. So, if you come to the substructure construction, uh, when we were doing the Lotus Tower, uh, it was very close to the uh, close to the lake. So this is the first experience, one of the first experience that we had. And then we were very careful. Here, we used a grout curtain uh, as a, as a we are, we, we, now here, this is our, our raft foundation. We had an outer perimeter, we had a grout curtain so that in the, uh, to in, uh, reduce the water ingress to the cavity. So this is a cement grout, uh, cement, uh, uh, cement uh, mixed grout, cement sand mixed grout is uh, injected around uh, very close to the perimeter. And then we use uh, 800 millimeter uh, dia boat pile wall and also grouted behind it. Uh, and because it is uh, circular in nature, you obviously uh, has it's a self sustain so you don't need cross bracing so uh, we use only two whaler beams to support the uh, so when you look at the tower body construction tower foundation construction it's a 3 meter uh, 3 3.5 meter deep uh, the main issue was the you know, the heat of hydration so the requirement is we have to keep it below 70 degrees uh, and uh, and also in order to do that we have to reduce the opc content in the mix so when you reduce the opc content in the mix uh, then the strength is also uh, can be reduced so we need we had uh, this is also one of our first experience and we had uh, professor nanakara professor mendis and uh, professor das the uh, three concrete experts to support us. And we finally uh, did about uh, 40 tires with different uh, mixes, uh, try to get the optimum uh, cement content. Uh, basically, uh, we came up with uh, PPC, 25% uh, fly ash uh, cement, uh, around 350, uh, 385. So basically, OPC content is around 260. So that is how with uh, water cement ratio of 0.37. So basically, water cement ratio is important to get the grade. And also, we try to uh, limit the cement content to uh, below 400. So the, the testing was done uh, because these were our first trials. And the actual uh, prototypes were done. And uh, uh, with the continuous uh, temperature monitoring. And also we use uh, flake ice on top of the uh, 
the to uh, to uh, to cool the aggregates because uh, aggregate is the largest component in the in the concrete mix so if you uh, cool uh, uh, cool 1 degree of uh, uh, aggregates below the ambient temperature your concrete temperature will be also go below 1 degree so the main uh, task was to uh, reduce the patient temperature to around 25 26 degrees so when you do that, uh, we were main managed to uh, control uh, the temperatures uh, below 70. Because we have uh, fly ash, uh, even Professor, uh, uh, Professor Nanakara was uh, okay to allow the temperature to around 80 degrees. And the logistic planning uh, is was a very uh, key thing for me as uh, so. Yeah, at that time, uh, uh, four four uh, thousand meter cube of concrete within a particular pore is a huge thing. After that, I know. Uh, uh, then um, uh, ITC they did uh, six thousand meter cube pore uh, by ICC, and this was the first uh, large pore uh, in Colombo, and. Uh, we, we a single supplier could not do uh, the do the uh, supply, so we had to have about five suppliers, including our contractor, and we are, we are, so there are there are, there are concrete is uh, plants are not close, different uh, so there are the setting times uh, and the transport admixture uh, dosage is different, so we had to discuss with them and the logistic plan. Uh, uh, is is very important. So this is so uh, we this uh, mainly what we did was uh, we at that time uh, one general was uh, uh, involved in the project. He closed the uh, closed the DR Vijayawardena Mahavata and uh, and it was a, a, a Muslim um, um, Prophet Muhammad's birthday or something like that and 8 August. So 8 is a good number. So the Chinese wanted to have for eight, uh, to, to the to China. So uh, so he, uh, we did the start the concrete 8, 8, 8 August, that is also 8, 8 o'clock in the night. So it went till uh, the next day, uh, night. And within uh, 36 hours, we completed the concrete. So this was our logistic plan. We wanted to see how the different people uh, put uh, on, uh, where are the different plants. Because if there's a problem, we don't. We should know which plant gave us the problem. And then uh, we got uh, 20 graduates to monitor different. Uh, 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 plants. One is monitoring the uh, slump, and other one is monitoring the temperature at the site. Make sure that there are no hole joints. So I generally I I, I was in command. I I put two graduates. You know, graduates are they do what they want. So two people at one point, and we had a briefing, and we told them. Um, the this is a historical moment. If you survive, you will be part of the history. Otherwise, you will be part of the structure. <laughs> so it was a it was a good uh, and uh, two of the graduates who man a particular uh, point got married. Uh, I I'm, I we are sure that that area concrete has not is not monitored. So 4,400 kilograms of uh, tons of steel uh, gone into the basement uh, were trapped. And the Chinese workers, the immaculate uh, uh, dedication, efficiency, and, and, and uh, neatness. Uh, so it is a beautiful site uh, to work with. You can see the, the trucks uh, giving 
I, I uh, quivering because uh, you can you even the uh, not only uh, that is not only concrete. Some are sand bowsers, some are um, uh, uh, cement bowsers because uh, no plant can hold that uh, cement or sand or aggregates. Uh, so it was a big uh, uh, lesson learned for me. And two dedicated professors uh, in the uh, on top of the concrete, monitoring the concrete, uh, and with us in the the whole night. In the morning, he comes and checks the temperature. So dedicated and very serious uh, for the dias. And uh, when we do the and here we had a sand blanket so that uh, there won't be any thermal shock due to uh, temperature variations or rain. And here, uh, at uh, when we are doing the waterfront, uh, we covered with uh, digiform to keep the temperature. Uh, because if you don't have, the, there's a big temperature gradient, you can have micro cracks in the concrete. So when we go to the, the Krish project, uh, we are the retaining system, um, the Chinese contractor, uh, now it's a, it's a about 20 meter deep uh, retaining wall because we had three basements. And uh, if we put uh, struts, they cannot work. So they, uh, so they were objecting to our design because they said we cannot do trust start and in, in China they can anchor to the outside. So they were arguing why you all cannot do it. This is Sri Lanka. We cannot do what they do in China. China, the total uh, uh, country is owned to the government and government can decide whatever they want. So, but we went uh, and met uh, the CMC engineer at that time. And he was very positive. Uh, initially, Chinese tried to go because we said, I cannot convince uh, the, the council uh, member, uh, engineers because uh, they no, don't normally, we cannot go outside our boundary. So they didn't believe us. They went to the uh, engineer and told, we wanted to do outside. And they, the generally, uh, the, that engineer, very straight person, he chased him, them away. Then I went and they, they said, I said, uh, Mr. This is a historical thing. Uh, this is the first time you are going to give, give the, uh, give the anchor, uh, anchors outside. This is a garment thing. And, and we, this is a renew, removable anchor. He said, if this is a removable anchor, he will give. But still we have not removed. Uh, but we, that is how I convinced. So basically, when we do these uh, anchors outside, we have to uh, monitor all. Uh, to, uh, we have to make sure that we do not we, our design design should not uh, harm the uh, the utility lines, water, electricity, telephone, underground cable. So we have to first do a survey, and so what. I did was, uh, so I make sure that this is the failure wedge, uh, and then we make sure uh, we anchor this into the rock. And, uh, and uh, so we have a lot of tools for now to check uh, uh, the, the forces. And uh, we have uh, proved uh, the council that our design is working. So this is how normally it happens. You build through the pile.
and like post sessioning, you can send them the answers uh, one by one. So you can see. Uh, Are it? Yes, of working. No, no, no topic. We are no ghostwriters. And excavation also uh, can be happened without any hindrance. Monitoring and instrumentation is very important in, in uh, retaining systems. Uh, uh, you need to have uh, inclinometers to uh, uh, to um, to uh, monitor the deflections. Uh, and also you have to have strain gauges to monitor the forces in the struts uh, because uh, you have calculated some force. If it is more than that, then it will be, so we, it's very difficult to predict this one and then better to uh, monitor and it also will be a study. And this was, uh, this project was monitored by uh, NBRO uh, day in, day out. And they asked us to uh, calculate uh, what's happened during installation, what happened during, uh, during removal and all the stressors calculations we need to give it to the NBRO. I think the gentleman who did the monitoring also, yeah, you did know. So we have to produce reports. Uh, what is the deflection? Now here, uh, we need to uh, uh, select the limits. Uh, so what is the alert limit? That means uh, low, uh, height over 600. What is the alarm limit? What is the action limit? So, so every uh, thing has to be monitored a uh, daily basis. So monitoring is a good business. Am I correct? Uh... <laughs> uh, so this is uh, this is uh, how uh, they do the include monitoring, and. Um, you so, uh, put a, a torpedo inside and uh, monitor the basis. And also, uh, vibration monitoring also very important. When we were doing the fish project, there was a uh, archaeological building. So, uh, if somebody is uh, interested in these uh, equipments, uh, somebody invest in this equipment. That's a good uh, business uh, case. Very few people uh, has this uh, monitoring um, equipment so that uh, we don't have any uh, bargaining power with the existing organization. <laughs> so we can, we have to, uh, there are CIA, CA guidelines based on the, uh, based on the uh, vulnerability of the, the project. Uh, the acceler acceleration limit uh, or uh, peak velocity limits are being uh, stipulated by the C uh, CIA uh, Central Environment Authority guideline. And this is one of the issues that we came across. Now, when we do a seek and fight, we assume uh, it is uh, not leaked. There are no gaps. So basically, uh, this project. Uh, when we dig, we uh, came across uh, leaks uh, because there are gaps between the, the piles. So uh, what we, uh, the action plan was, now we don't know where the gaps are until we, uh, we excavate. As soon as we uh, excavate, you start, the water start coming and then we, Started. I mean, uh, there, this was the, we didn't have a pre previous experience with this, but I, I showed you all what I have done before. There's no problems on this project. Uh, so basically, what I did was uh, initially we tried to do uh, uh, at that particular point for horizontal grouting. So you grout against the water. Sometimes uh, it is not uh, easy. So uh, at a particular if the water coming, you cannot drop. 
So uh, you have to have a, a concrete or steel sheet uh, uh, to uh, to uh, to do to ex uh, fix to the piles to exert this force. Uh, so it can be around eighty bar pressure. It's a huge pressure. And then what we did was we did the uh, uh, behind the cutoff wall. Now cutoff wall is very very weak. We don't know we are the leaks. So basically we did another grouting layer, uh, grout piles behind the cutoff wall to seal the gaps. So that is how we came up out of the project. Otherwise it would be a disaster. So this is uh, before and after uh, grouting. Before we had leaks and then after grouting, horizontal grouting and vertical grouting behind the tower, we were able to stop the leak. The, uh, so with respect to foundations, uh, we'll start with the foundations on rock. Uh, in this project, uh, you can see uh, some part is our pad foundations on rock and some part is on piles. Uh, the logic, uh, why we didn't go for this one, um, because uh, it was my what I, I I I what I thought was if the uh, the basement the raft is uh, raft uh, after the foundation the foundation is more than five meters, uh, it is a risk to excavate more. So then it is better to uh, have piles on the. So this is because the settlements are very low. So what, what I thought was, uh, so uh, this area very close to uh, the electricity board. Uh, so therefore at that point, uh, what I did was to uh, have piles here uh, embedded in the rock to take this area. These areas we can uh, easily excavate and the uh, and the rock level is very close so we had uh, so basically this is uh, you won't get rock at uh, at a flat level you had different levels so we we uh, if uh, so we have to uh, there are guidance uh, in the code if there are uh, slopes how to uh, how to anchor anchor depths uh, we need to calculate uh, the course along the uh, uh, along the shear plane and uh, try to uh, sometimes uh, you need to uh, anchor and uh, fill that uh, area with uh, concrete so there are a lot of uh, learning in this one uh, so this is the, the final outcome of the rock and uh, Mainly, um, uh, uh, mainly uh, at different levels, uh, we have anchored this one, and then uh, we have also built on that. It's uh, very safe, uh, and it is now about sixty stories up. This is another challenging job uh, I got um, initially. Uh, we designed this building. Uh, with a, a plan, with another plan uh, for, uh, and then this they sold this uh, property to another plan because we have designed this before. The project came to us because they know we had done piling, and then we have a better understanding than the other engineers. And but the total configuration was different. So it was a challenge. Now, say for instance, this is a new area. This is the existing piles that we have done. So uh, then the architects want uh, lift at different level, uh, uh, different orientations, uh, and uh, uh, so and we had to see and uh, some some of the column lows are more than. Uh, what we anticipated earlier. So there were a lot of breaking to do, and you can see uh, different colors, new columns, 
and uh, new leaf areas in the file cap. These are the new columns. So this was the old building. We had to break the top part. And uh, there was a uh, water tank below uh, in, in integrating the file caps. So, so this is, uh, they are breaking the this thing. So basi basically when you are breaking, you have to use uh, power tools uh, to break efficiently. And, uh, and then you have to modify the foundation. You have to modify the foundation. Uh, to take the new loads. So, and also uh, uh, steel jacketing was used uh, to uh, enhance the capacity of the uh, the concrete uh, columns uh, so that uh, it can take the new loads. So these are, this is, this is one of the new, uh, one of the challenges that I encountered during the last 10 years. With respect to uh, this project, uh, there are a lot of um, piling machines uh, going here and there. Uh, and then um, mainly uh, this was our criteria where uh, there are, cannot be two adjacent piles within 10 meters uh, and cannot be bored within 48 hours. So that was our tender criteria. So. You can see uh, this is the machine movement that we monitored. Uh, so basically, this project got delayed uh, due to various reasons. The mainly what I saw was the machine movements. So the piling uh, rigs movement has to be very efficient if you wanted to make a, the uh, reduce the uh, the piling time. The mainly uh, when we selecting the test testing uh, uh, for piles for testing, uh, more, I didn't see any logic uh, before. Uh, uh, so basically, uh, when we doing the uh, Hyatt Hotel called Celestia Residency, uh, that was one of the tallest building at that time. That is that was the tallest building at the time. Uh, the client consultant wanted to uh, test all the files for PDA. Uh, so at that time, the PDA test was very new and they, they are charging 1 million per test. So the client engineers asked whether you can reduce it. Then I wanted to find a logic to reduce the file. So basically, uh, but I uh, came up with, then I came to a, uh, uh, a seminar like this uh, done by uh, Dr. Gunaratna. He was talking about selecting uh, uh, management, selecting roads using a fussy logic techniques. Now say for instance, there's a particular budget for selecting roads. So there are so many variables how to make a logic to select the, a particular road for construction. So I thought, why not uh, we use the same logic to select the files? So we, we developed a new technique called uh, fuzzy logic technique to select the files. If you go, uh, go to your home and see the air, con your air conditioning or the washing machine, it works on fuzzy logic principle. Your wife or you generally operate a particular pattern. That pattern is captured by the logic, by the machine. If you don't press any button, also they they, they do that one. So basically, uh, uh, you you go and see that is called fuzzy logic in your washing machine, right? So even the air conditioning now uh, they have fuzzy logic technique. The way you operate. They, they know what to do. Otherwise, you are pressing buttons without any meaning, right? So if you then just switch on, they will capture the logic because it's a very fast system. So pile can... Um,
file can uh, ha will have so many variables. Really, machine will be a variable. Uh, file uh, 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 equipment file uh, auger will be a issue. So so and also the concreting, maintain the borehole, uh, concrete uh, concrete quality. Everything is an issue. So, so therefore, uh, the, uh, we came up with this mathematical model for fuzzy logic on expert judgment. So the expert in the site only has to have linguistic variables like satisfactory, moderately satisfactory, not satisfactory. Let's say uh, you uh, try to uh, the rock socketing. Rock socketing, then uh, you estimate something, some distance, but actually the uh, you cannot go to that depth practically. Then you come up with a, uh, so you can, the, the expert can judge whether it's satisfactory. If it is, goes to the that level, then it's satisfactory. If it cannot go, it can be moderately satisfactory or not satisfactory. So likewise, you give a, a, a give a, a linguistic determination on a particular aspect, and then you can give a score based on the the severity of the aspect. So we have a weightage for that, and then you get a final score, and every pile will have a score. Based on the score, you can select the worst piles. So I have employed this uh, to all my projects, uh, uh, and uh, it's, it's very successful, and it's logical. So basically, if you look at a PID test, uh, it is a, if you look at this, it is a very good, good uh, uh, PID. Am I correct? It's a good one. Now. I was wondering what is the bad one. So I used to look at a uh, particular uh, this thing. I, I we always as engineers, structural engineers think whether these guys have cleaned the piles. If there whether there will be soft toe. So if it is a soft toe, what will be the uh, outcome of your PIT? So I what I observe was if it is a good uh, good. Embedded soil, it will it will come down. If it is a soft toe, it, right? Then, and if it is necking, you always get a positive. So basically, so all that, and uh, so based on that file integrity, I gave forty percent of the uh, score and. Uh, for quality of drilling machine, rock socketing, maintaining the borehole, cleaning the borehole, quality of uh, concreting, we have given different scores. Okay, and then if it is satisfactory zero, moderate satisfactory fifteen, likewise. So a particular pile, let's say, uh, you you multiply this and you get a score and you get a final score. All right. So now these piles. One pile. Um, so, so in this project, uh, four was the uh, the uh, the lowest cost. So, if we, if we have only four four piles to check, four was the number. So, what we did was now check all those piles. Actually, it has uh, it it didn't mobilize the capacity. Initially, when I did this, uh, our uh, des our designs were checked by the the uh, uh, Singaporean consultants, called, uh, and they said, "How do you select those pipes?" I said, "You are the consultant. You tell me." We didn't tell this secret until we published a paper at ISR, and uh, we are fortunate because. Uh, Tenacon was chair in that session. And uh, so 
this is a very good uh, method uh, and also we, 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 I didn't put this here, we, we were able to repair these pines using uh, pressure grouting. And the waterproofing uh, at Lotus, we use uh, bentonite uh, waterproofing, sorry, uh, the torch on mem mem membrane. Uh, torch on membrane, the problem is uh, you cannot do in, uh, in wet, wet surfaces. So generally, I, I prefer to do bentonite uh, uh, waterproofing underground because bentonite is a natural material and you can do under uh, wet condition. And because it is one of the things that you uh, uh, delays the project. So if you ask consultants, we can ask them to torch, but they cannot torch because the rain. And also there is another way, uh, if it is a very deep basement, you can also have a, a, a cavity drain where in, if, the, uh, if the water coming inside, you can drain uh, that water uh, uh, to the, uh, with respect to superstructure, the formwork systems are very important, docker formwork. And then uh, you can also see prefabricated um, mesh. Uh, uh, when we're doing the Lotus Tower, we, were, uh, we, uh, we asked the contractor to do prefabricated uh, steel mesh. Uh, you can easily uh, increase the, your time and also you will utilize the trade efficiently. And the formwork system is also important. We are, uh, jump form is uh, the name of the day these days. You jump uh, one level or two level at what time. And uh, so prefabricated uh, steel, if you are doing uh, tall, uh, tall buildings, uh, always make sure offsite uh, construction and uh, assembly on site. Uh, is the key. The mainly concreting. Concreting, uh, uh, concrete, you cannot use uh, normal concrete uh, to pump. Uh, and uh, you have to use uh, self compacting concrete. Um, hope this video works. Self compacting concrete um, is. Uh, It uh, less vibration and the noise, and um, it is a uh, uh, high performance concrete. Generally, uh, self compacting concrete, the the uh, cost to find ratio is almost one. And the other thing is uh, when you uh, pump uh, at higher higher levels, uh, you need to uh, reduce the the coarse aggregate size and increase fly ash and also uh, 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 fly ash or super pasteurizers. So during concreting at uh, uh, Lotus Tower, we uh, friction was a major issue. Uh, and then um, we, we tried to uh, reduce the friction. It, it went through a cool bath and use a uh, uh, robotic arm to pump concrete. It, it also travels uh, with the, uh, the tower. So, surveying is a major thing. Uh, we we have we use uh, uh, three type of surveying. Uh, one is uh, uh, total station, uh, laser, and also a GPS to do the surveying. Mainly, uh, with respect to the tower uh, at a uh, in a cyclone, uh, it can generate tension. So uh, there was post tensioning um, uh, vertically. Uh, that was a, a new experience for us because generally we use uh, horizontal post tensioning, and also now uh, most of the time we use um, uh, couplers because if you don't use couplers, there will be a lot of waste in column uh, lapping. And during my first project, it was a switch type coupler that I used. And uh, at that time, the concrete grade was around 50. And then the column size was 1.8 meter by 1.8, too big. When we are doing the, the waterfront, a similar height building, 
and we use uh, 650 by 750 that was the allowed and this is a composite building and we used grade 80 concrete uh, not on the, uh, in the lab but on site so basically it was a triple blend mix uh, we use uh, ppc 546 uh, and silica film 36 uh, kilograms uh, generally um, um, so it's a triple blend fly as 35 percent but generally my idea is not to go for more than 450 uh, kilograms per meter cube opc so you have and also there's a code restriction for silica film you cannot go more than six to eight percent because it becomes brittle so basically we we reach uh, uh, this and it, we reach about 100. So basically our target uh, mean strength was 100 and uh, our characteristic uh, strength was 80, 85, 70, 85. 85 is the uh, cube strength. So basically uh, what we have to understand is when you are using very high strength concrete, you need to have a higher margins. Otherwise, uh, you can get into trouble because uh, your, your steel demand is very high. If you can see, uh, this is a transfer structure that I uh, use. Generally, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, of course, with the guidance of uh, Professor Mendes, we came up with the solution where uh, we came. What we did was uh, uh, it's a hybrid system where most of the time you look at transfer structure, you exactly uh, people use the transfer, uh, transfer beams on columns. Here, it's a hybrid system where you have uh, you, you don't the it is not necessary the top uh, grid matches with the transfer grid so it is a uh, it is a, it is you have main beams uh, oh sorry it's not there main beams and, and uh, secondary beams uh, and and a thick slab to transfer the uh, and the uh, steel uh, uh, steel construction for the tower house was uh, one of our learning, uh, and it is uh, it is uh, it was built on the on space. So basically, it, uh, the tower body was fifteen meters. Tower uh, tower house is thirty six meters. So you need to uh, have wing walls, and also there will be our sport post tensioning. A uh, lot of challenges with the with the uh, force work. And you can see the force work is uh, below, uh, extending about 40 meters from the tower body. And the embedded plates uh, are important uh, to receive the uh, receive the tower house. What time I should stop? Okay. So basically, uh, uh, sloping um, column, very challenging. Uh, and all pre prefabricated staircase, etc. In the in the fireproofing is another thing. We are uh, there are different types of uh, fireproofing. Uh, it's still the uh, twin films. Uh, we use uh, image uh, space uh, thick. Uh, coating uh, it's around uh, 25 millimeter. We build that very slowly. Slab systems uh, is very important because uh, the speed of construction depends on the slab systems. Most of the the twin peaks we achieved around uh, four to five days per uh, flow, and by the local contract sunk in. Uh, and also every Castoria, we uh, we also uh, 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 achieved around uh, four to five days. So basically, when we are designing a slab system, uh, it should be very easy to construct. Otherwise, it will take a long time. So it can be uh, beams, it can be steel deck, it can be post tension slabs. So most of the time, uh, what we do is. Uh, we use uh, flat slabs with uh, uh, drop, uh, drop panels uh, at the basement levels. If possible, uh, we can use uh, the same configuration in other levels because it can also, uh, because generally 
structure height is a big cost. So if you can reduce the structure height by even one inch, you can save a lot of money. So uh, generally, um, uh, for services, they need about 600 millimeters. Uh, if we uh, structure is also around 600 millimeters, then the total 1.2 uh, is for engineering. And then uh, your structure, uh, so if we can reduce the structure height, uh, you can reduce the cost. Uh, here, this is uh, Ekorama, where architect gave us only 450 millimeter beam depth, uh, about 10 meter span. Uh, so what uh, we did was uh, post-tension beams and post-tension slabs. So generally, I do not like all post-tensioning uh, because uh, you cannot have a lot of modifications after that. So generally, what I do is uh, we always uh, do post-tension beams, uh, slabs we will do normal. Uh, uh, this is uh, the ramp at uh, Trizen. Uh, you can see, you cannot see uh, the the any beams. Uh, the reason I, I not generally like very clean uh, surface. Uh, so we have used the the guard wall to support the slab. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, I just promote seamless construction, seamless design. It's easy to construct. Post tensioning has uh, this is uh, at Lotus Tower. We did uh, unbonded uh, PT uh, where you can. Uh, uh, this is to control the cracking because the the. Uh, the tower base is around eight, 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 80 meters. Uh, and uh, this is a CCC, uh, it's a, a slab, uh, total post tension and very minimum uh, non PT steel. This is again uh, post tension, uh, uh, horizontal post tensioning. And the, this one is uh, now, these are called post strips where we keep these post strips. Uh, when we have a uh, base, we have a podium and, uh, and a tower. A tower settles, a subtle tower elastically shortens. So you need to, you cannot connect to the podium. So we need to have a post strip, which is going to, we can cast after casting the tower. But it is an issue uh, because you have the water will come to the basements and et cetera, et cetera. But uh, the, uh, if you don't do it, uh, you will have cracks on the floor. So this is this is uh, this was the earlier transfer flow uh, arrangement. So the lower floors are not in in uh, tallying uh, with the upper floor. Facades are very interesting. Uh, there are two types of facade: uh, stick system and unitized panels. So stick systems are you have the uh, the mullions and the transoms, and they use stick the uh, stick the uh, glass onto the system. Where unitized panel, you the total unit is taken uh, from outside. You can straight away go and fix uh, to the uh, receivers. Oh. Different challenges, uh, mainly Lotus Tower, the um, uh, tower mass was a major challenge. Uh, it's around uh, 80 meters tall. Uh, steel section itself uh, around uh, 66 meters tall and uh, about 80 tons uh, weight. So you can see different type of sections uh, in the uh, tower. The main reason for different uh, sections, the lower part is concrete. And if you look at carefully, we have not paint that concrete. Uh, paint. We have not applied any paint because uh, when you it moves, it moves if you paint it, you will you will it will it, the paint will crack. Uh, so the the main thing uh, in in a mast is uh, you try to confuse the wind at different different height. You have different different sections. Uh, then you will not get the same vortex shading at different at same level. So the, what happens is when the wind passes a body, it attach and detach. It doesn't detach uh, simultaneously. It, it there's a small lag about two seconds. It will also 
it will generate a lateral swing on the tower. So tower mast erection was a major issue. Uh, we, did, uh, we were thinking how to uh, take it up. So basically, finally, we decided to uh, take piece by piece and uh, jack, uh, jack piece by piece. Uh, so basically, this is the practical operation uh, where we tried to uh, take uh, six meter uh, sections and and try to uh, uh, take it uh, to the uh, place through uh, wheels and use four jacks uh, to uh, erect. Uh, it's very, it's it's moving very fast, slow. So this was my nightmare until it got erected. So basically, we had a couple of engineers uh, uh, staying there uh, full time. Welding. These are very thick plates, around forty millimeters. Uh, four welders welding at the same time. Yeah, so very important. Uh, so building, you cannot, you have to have qualified weld, welders before, and then uh, uh, if it is uh, not properly well, uh, it will fit. So you have to preheat the preheat, preheating process, post-heating process. Uh, so a lot of uh, things that I learned during the, uh, and also you check uh, using uh, UPV or. Uh, 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 and uh, sink spray onto that uh, to galvanize because when you uh, we need to protect it because uh, very difficult to repair later. Corrosion is a major project. You can see uh, different uh, stages of the mast. This is me uh, climbing. Wind studies was another uh, uh, first in in our our careers. Uh, we are first initially we did the wind simulation uh, using CFD, and uh, Professor Mendes' team did this FSI work, uh, very very sophisticated work, and we did uh, all three type of uh, two type of uh, wind tunnels that is rigid uh, body uh, method and also the um, uh, elastic method. Yeah, it is more accurate. And for the tower uh, uh, tower house, we did a separate test for because it is uh, to capture the uh, stressors. So basically, when you look at it, the uh, tower house, the petals are designed for about 5 kp alone. Uh, generally, we need to um, uh, model the city. For this test, uh, Professor Disanaga was with us at, in Sydney. Uh, and uh, for the Twin Peak, uh, uh, so generally, it's, uh, like a turn table, you you have a there's a wind coming from one side, and then uh, we we turn the uh, the uh, the model, and then uh, at different fifteen degree intervals, we take the uh, uh, stresses uh, or forces uh, uh, from the uh, instrumentation. There are different types. And this is another uh, challenge uh, that we came across, the outriggers. If you go to PETA, you can see this. The reason is to uh, control the drift uh, due to wind. And uh, these outriggers are placed at machine room level. And uh, so generally what it does is it controls the drift and the deflections. I'm not going to talk about much with the theory. It is, uh, we are just tra trying to touch on the challenges. So this is, uh, this is a model that one of my colleagues made. Uh, this one. Okay, okay. Did a mistake. Okay, so that's, this is another challenge that we got, the sky bridge. The sky bridge at uh, Twin Peaks was a major challenge. We are the two towers are moving independently, 
and in the in the event it can move uh, we have to uh, look at the worst case scenario where it can move from each other uh, and then uh, we have designed this uh, uh, this uh, bridge so that uh, it, it it has dampers uh, so that people will not feel the vibration and also um, also um, it also be we used for in case of fire at uh, in one people can use this to cross to the other so uh, this is uh, uh, the sky bridge uh, that we're talking about where you have the dampers uh, unfortunately i could not put uh, an actual picture here um, so other uh, challenge is uh, was these cantilevers uh, uh, this cantilever uh, is 29 meters and uh, this one was uh, 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 40, 40 meters and then it is supported by a, uh, a leaning prop of 10 degrees. So initially this was our challenge, uh, how to make this leaning uh, uh, prop uh, because uh, when you are doing, uh, it's always leaning and then uh, uh, architect's intention is to bring this to this position. So how to, uh, when you do concrete, the elastic modulus is very low. It will have a time, time so, and also uh, how uh, it will, it will deflect more and it is a continuous pole. Uh, so we we studied this uh, issue, uh, uh, and then uh, basically, if it is uh, analyzed like that, it is only three millimeter deflection. But actually, uh, it will uh, we we construct like this. So it will it will um, it will bend. If we do, uh, uh, because of the extensity of uh, the load. So we will not reach the required position unless we do some adjustment. So we need to have a calculator. Uh, we have to see how, how we can control that. Initially, we prop, we have a temporary propping, and then, uh, then we have to do corrections uh, to uh, come to the uh, at each level. So we have to give the correction to the contractor at each level uh, based on their uh, based on their, uh, their their construction time. So sequential time. So basically uh, uh, dead load uh, because of the dead load uh, so deflection uh, uh, so unsupported one we analyze it's about 70 8 millimeter deflection, supported 65 uh, millimeter deflection, and then uh, we have to see how to correct it. So basically, um, what I uh, what what I want is as soon as we achieve the achieve the particular level, I ask the contractor to tie the uh, tie the uh, uh, structure to the to our structure and try to control at that level so until then we monitor the deflection and and try to uh, reduce it to about 10 millimeters so it is it is although you see it straight it is not straight it always like this so basically uh, elevated bridge Construction is a major challenge uh, because we are in the space from both sides. And then uh, every, every... Why is that a kind of steel uh, friction? So every time uh, until uh, this tie is placed, I was really curious, uh, worried. And then uh, ev every time, the structural stresses are varying. It is not the final. So we need to calculate and see every element is has uh, is okay at each each and every uh, level.
So finally, the deflections were calculated and tested. For the front cantilever, also similar, uh, uh, we, we tried to calculate and do each and every step. We try to see whether any stresses are uh, exceeded and also the connection you need to check. So this is how we calculate, uh, constructed the, the cantilever. Then the, the problem with the cantilevers is the vibration. So vibration, when you walk, you can feel the vibration. And then, uh, but uh, people are sleeping uh, and there are dance floors on top. So we, we, we had to have uh, uh, supplementary uh, uh, dampers, we call uh, tune mass dampers. Uh, uh, so basically, if you do not uh, damp, uh, you will get uh, wobble. Right, so you need to study that. Uh, this is the the, the exciting two structures. Uh, so basically, how the uh, uh, tune dam mask were, were used is if we try if you tune the uh, uh, tune the external damper to uh, equal to the frequency of the the structure. Then it, when there is a vibration, it will also start vibrating because we have tried to tune the. Uh, so we have to know the natural period of the uh, of the flow or the particular structural mode. So what we uh, try to uh, 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 use is uh, this is the type of there are different type of uh, tune mask dampers. I am talking about what I use. Uh, here, uh, uh, so you can see uh, the vibration. Uh, if you have a damper, uh, it will uh, it will uh, die down very fast. Okay, so this is uh, this is a typical example because it is it is moving the other way. So basically, uh, you have the natural frequency. At, at a particular frequency, it will resonate. If you have the damper, it will uh, die down. So basically, we use uh, this uh, Den Hartog method uh, to initially calculate uh, uh, what is the uh, uh, how to tune the damper, where uh, what is the damping ratio that we need to uh, have with respect to the structural damping. So what we did was initially you look at different modes and see what are the, the frequencies. And then we see if we put that damper uh, theoretically in the particular uh, place, what will, uh, and we, are, we have to see, we have to put the dampers. We, we, we cannot put just put dampers anywhere. So we have to do a theoretical study done by an expert team from Germany called GERB. And we have to understand what they're doing. And we also did parallelly uh, uh, models and try to see uh, whether they are doing the right thing. Because as consultants, we are. So we, they, we put uh, different dampers at different places and try to so, and then they came, uh, initially this exercise is to uh, find the natural frequencies. And basically there are jump test, uh, drop heel test, uh, walking test. To try to find the structure and try to uh, find the dampers. What is the first harmonic, second harmonic, third harmonic, etc. This is a walking test. Uh, 
so we find the the, the harmonics uh, and then uh, based on that uh, 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 the, we try to uh, place the dampers at the correct position and try to uh, try to uh, see how the how the the uh, the structure behaves and there is a factor called um, uh, response factor response factor is now generally this is a iso perception now we, when we when we that is a perception criteria and then uh, what is the for different different areas you have different different response factor, factors so let's say you have a, uh, a, a area we are sleeping you don't need to have, have uh, you can not have a vibration it will disturb you then you have a low a low, low response factor. If it is a dancing flow, even it vibrates, you don't have a problem. So you have a higher response factor. So these, so we need to uh, after uh, fixing, we need to uh, check whether we have achieved this response. This is the kind of uh, damper you have to supplementary uh, this thing. And based on the, you have you can see there are some plates to uh, to. When you change the page, your frequencies will, and also there you can even change the springs. So, so basically, I will stop now. Uh, thank you very much. I have to uh, thank uh, Professor Mendis and uh, Mr. Balman who gave us the opportunities to uh, navigate through uh, this experience. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for listening. I know it's too late. Uh, uh, Hope you enjoy the talk. Thank you very much, Nir Shiroman Fernando, for your very informative lecture. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I think you have you had an opportunity to listen to a very eminent structural engineer who part who did lot. To change the skyline of the Colombo during last few years, of course, not few, I would say at 20, 30 years, maybe. Okay. So I think um, we can enter a few questions. If I mean, people, those who have already connected in online, you also can send any questions if you have, and also the people, those who are in the audience. I hope you finish your friend can answer a few questions. Generally, uh, what uh, the so there was a like a small gap. Okay, so basically, what they did was initially uh, we were concerned about the uh, there can be a, we cannot hundred percent seal the gap. So they also put a like a swelling uh, waterproofing uh, or bentonite to seal that uh, additional precaution. Still, one uh, one section open. Uh, so basically, uh, what my thought was, uh, I mean, we we gave them the advice uh, to grout behind the cutoff wall. So always better to grout so to avoid this kind of accidents. So uh, so there was a small leak, and it, it became uh, no no. There's like a open out. It's like a open it's around uh, 15 to 16 meters it is embedded into the rock they have to i mean the total wall was not collapsed uh, the no, no, interlock no. was it's open no, it's only the interlock open There are questions in the chat title. Since there's no more questions, I think we can conclude today's session. So let me invite our president, engineer Professor Ranjit Dishanayak to give away the token of appreciation to engineer Shiro Malfernando. 
فاهم thank you very much thank you very much dear participants participants for your kind participation and also i would like to extend my sincere gratitude to secretariat of institute of engineering sri lanka for organizing and their kind assistance thank you very much dear ladies and gentlemen have a pleasant evening good time